Okay, why, why don't we uh, just welcome God into this midst, yeah, before we start the talk. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just want to ask that you be with us, Lord, as we talk about marriage and money matters, that you walk with us, Lord, in our, this long journey of marriage, and teach us how to manage our financial resources so that we can really praise you and use it for your greater glory. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Okay, blessed evening, everyone. Welcome to the Gift Stewardship Talks. In this session, this is part of a series of talks organized by the Catholic Foundation to raise our awareness on our personal stewardship, on our gifts of time, talent, and treasure. So what we want to do is this, is that we want to have to manage our gifts such that these are the ones that God gave it to us. Bernie? Yeah. Um, so just a quick one. I mean, we won't go into a lot of detail, but the session will discuss some money management uh, within a Christian marriage. And, you know, we know how poor management of money uh, can be a silent killer of uh, some marriages. So we also share some of our personal anecdotes and, you know, how between uh, Xavier and myself, we within our marriages actually also um, manage our monies. Okay. Next slide. Okay, I'm Xavier. I'm married at the Church of Our Lady of Perpetual Circle in 1991. So my wife and I are married for 30 years. Okay, Bernie is not my wife. <laughs> I have four kids. I'm currently the chairman of the Parish Pastoral Council. I was an engineer in the Republic of Singapore Air Force for more than 20 years. I'm retired, but now I work as an adjunct lecturer on counseling-related skills. Okay, next slide. Okay, I've got four kids. Uh, two boys and two girls. My two elder boys are already married. And the eldest is 29 years old this year. And the youngest is 17 years old. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bernadette. Um, I've been married for about seven years. I would say I've, I'm, an in, I'm an extrovert. But I'm married to an introvert. If you met my husband, you would know what I mean. Uh, I work in communications in a local bank. And I'm also uh, a lector at the Church of the Holy Family and a board member of the Catholic Foundation. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so next slide. Now, to start off, let us read the gospel and uh, try to understand how God sees marriage and money. So in Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 to 3, Jesus taught his disciples, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son, and send his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast. So there are three aspects to the kingdom of God. The first is God. He wants all of us to be happy. And he gives a marriage feast to his son. And what does marriage feast consist of? It consists of the community, which includes the son and the wife, the household, and his friends. And he generously gives a marriage feast to all the friends. Now, the question we want to ask ourselves is this. Are we sometimes too focused on only one aspect of our lives that we forget the other two? And in doing so, we may have this blind spot. And it is because of this blind spot that we may not receive the blessings that God wants to give us. So let's take a look at these three scenarios. Okay. So in this uh, first scenario, it could be this time, you know, maybe um, before we are married and we are very involved in church activities and we spend a lot of time contribute to church, you know, um, we spend our time, our talent, our treasures, we provide a lot to our ministries, for example. And if we are married and we have children, um, sorry, yeah, yes, yes, correct. So this, sorry, yeah, God and money. This part where we do, a, we contribute a lot, right, to the church, to our ministries. The second is a scenario where maybe, you know, we are, we are married, right? But the marriage neglects the presence of God. So for instance, I recall the first few years of my own marriage, right? We were very focused on our careers. We just, 
worked a lot, we went back home, we spent a lot of money on ourselves, you know, just on, on, my, on our own interests and on our own careers. We had a lot of freedom, right, to choose to do whatever we wanted. And while we may be still a little bit involved in church work, it's very enticing to just spend the money on ourselves. So it's, it's very inward looking and God features very, very little in, in that scenario. Okay, so in the third scenario, we want to start a family and we want to raise children in a godly way. Now, when the children come, the family dynamic changes. We are no more focusing on the marriage. We are no more focusing on God. Most of the families will actually focus on the children. So a lot of time and resources are focused on giving care to them. Now, if we are not financially wise in managing our money, we will find that there will be a lot of time in which we are talking about how to cater to our resources and all that. And more often than not, it will lead to a lot of conflict because we care for our children. So instead of being a Christ-centered family, we end up having a lot of conflicts with the use of our money and resources. So the next slide shows this. Now, many of the couples will struggle with these three aspects of life. Now, while there are many, many books written on God alone, there are many books written on marriage alone, a lot of books written on financial management alone, there are very few books written on what, how God is involved in our marriage and money. So to have a holistic approach to marriage and money, may I recommend that you read this book by John and Evelyn Bean. They cover four aspects of our marriage and money. Financial discipleship and stewardship. It covers financial decisions as a couple. It covers credit and debt and imagining what a marriage should be. Now, John and Evelyn Bean has been leading the Campus Catholic Network for more than 10 years. And they have been promoting that all Catholics should actually follow biblical principles in managing their finances. Okay. You know, when we get married, we recite our wedding vows, right? I take you, so-and-so, to be my husband. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honour you all the days of my life. Maybe some of you will remember that. But in addition to this vow, uh, many of us also maybe attend MPC or Engage Encounter EE, all right, before our weddings. And we may also then attend Marriage Encounter after that as well. So these are all very good ways um, that we can help ourselves, right? We attend these causes to stay committed in our marriage. But the one thing that is not covered a lot, I think, in all of these causes is the idea of how to really uh, look at managing our monies. I think this is something that's not well explored, right, uh, within the church. And most of the time, we may not know actually how our spouse spends money until, or how, what their approach is to money until we start living with them. And based on the book that Xavier shared earlier, actually there are some very stereotypical uh, financial personality types, right, with regards to money management. Okay, and it's derived from a very simple quiz. It's not very comprehensive, but it's a quiz, and ultimately you take some, you know, you do some of these questions, and then we wind up with one of these four personality types. Okay, and I'm going to share with you what some of these personality types are. Uh, they actually resemble um, the behaviours of animals, and as we go through these uh, four types, you might recognise yourself in some of them. Okay, so what are the challenges you may face if you are a certain personality type and your spouse is some other personality type? This is the money evader. So which, this... Which I will talk a little bit about oh. it. Oh, wait, wait, let me go backwards. So it's okay, it's okay. So I will talk about the money oh, evader. Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> so the money evader is actually good at earning money. He doesn't believe that money is bad. It's just that when he talks about money, he gets stressed out. So he's like an ostrich burying the head in the sand. He doesn't want to think about the future, about planning and budgeting. Now, this strategy actually backfires. Because if you don't plan, your anxiety actually goes up. 
And for him, he feels very incompetent and he's overwhelmed when talking about money. Next one will be the money hermit personality. Now, for this person, money spent anything else besides the basic needs he considers a waste of money. Now, for this money hermit, he is very afraid that someone may think that he's greedy or a sellout. But the good thing about this money hermit is that he's very passionate about helping his friends, and he is uncompromising in his principles. So what he does is that he prioritizes the causes that speak to his heart. Now, another personality type is a money director. It sounds like a, a bit strange, but basically this personality type is like the squirrel that likes to hoard, like hoard a lot of things for the winter. So it believes that you know, your financial goals should come before your life goals, you love to budget, you love to save, and you don't really spend money on yourself or even your loved ones. You, this person right, may equate uh, self-worth with net worth. Right? and is a very conservative investor, not likely to make any risky investments. Right? This is a money director. And the last is the ceaseless spender. I don't know if I fit into this personality type. I don't think so. But I do like to spend my money, and my husband does not. He's maybe a bit more like the money director. Um, this person probably likes to you know, use your money to buy goods, and you spend on yourself, you spend on your family and your friends. The good thing is that you're probably very generous. Right? You're very excited to spend money on other people. And you're probably often the life of the party, but maybe you might struggle with not being very good at budgeting. Maybe you struggle with like always you know, <laughs> exceeding your budgets or overspending. Maybe you've got credit card debt. Okay, so what are the challenges living with your spouse who may have a different financial personality? For me, I'm like an ostrich. I was the sole breadwinner of the family, and my wife is the homemaker. So when my kids were young, what I did was just to focus on my career. As long as I earn enough, I support my wife financially, and I let her manage the domestic budget. My wife, on the other hand, is like the money hermit. She is a typical Singapore mother. She cares about the welfare and the well-being of the children, and of course, she cares about the education for them. Now, with such unspoken division of labor, there's actually nothing to talk about. So, as long as I give my wife some money, I don't want to know any of the problems she faced. Next slide. Now, let me share with you my situation where I did not follow God's principle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 29, verse 12, it says, Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, what this verse says is this. God is in control of everything. My responsibility is really to make use of the time, talent, and treasure in managing our finances well. But I was ostrich. I failed in managing some of our finances. And you can see in this pie chart what happened. I made this pie chart when I was in my 40s. You can see that almost 30% was spent on education for my four kids. Now, are there areas in which I could have saved? Probably, but I didn't really ask my wife. So as a result, I had to take a loan. You can see that 23.2%, which I took a few years to repay back. So it became a constant area where we had a lot of conflict. Now, are there areas in which we should consciously look at in other areas like personal, health, utilities, and all that? Yes, definitely so. Now, 
Is mine just a case of personal financial mismanagement? If you think mine is an isolated case, let me just share with you some of the Singapore-based statistics that you may want to think about and whether you fit into this profile. So this is a graph of the median gross uh, monthly income in Singapore. And I think in general, regardless of income, uh, many Singaporeans, you peak in our careers probably into our 40s. And at this age, we are usually given you know, more responsibilities at work, more leadership positions at work. The interesting thing is that the, um, the average age for a couple to start a family is around 30 years old. So by the time that they are maybe in their 40s, you've got your kids who are in adolescence, um, maybe going to become teens, a lot of emotional turmoil, um, a lot of social and emotional changes right, to adolescence. So there's actually a lot of stresses in the family. Now, I don't recall being a very bad teenager, right? but I'm very certain that my parents also you know, had a lot of challenges during the time that I was a teen. This next graph will show the median age in which Singaporean couples tend to divorce. And you can see that tends to be in the early 40s. So there could be some kind of alignment there um, in so far as you know, when the pressures start building up, when you are, you know, when your, your kids maybe are into their teens, there's a lot of stresses of family at home, at work, you get a lot more responsibilities, you're actually probably making a lot more money as well. Uh, is there some kind of a correlation, right, between that and when couples tend to divorce? These marriages probably tend to last, like, what, 10 to 13 um, years, and that's probably about the average time, and then that's when couples tend to divorce. So Xavier will now share some of the reasons for couples breaking up. Okay, so there are many reasons why couples divorce. You can see on this graph that the top two reasons is communication breakdown. The second reason is constant quarreling. Now, these two are related to each other. If you have communication breakdown, uh, definitely it will lead to constant quarreling. Now, when couples quarrel, they need someone to listen to. Who did they go to? They may go back to the relatives or the family, or they may speak to some confidant, some colleagues, some friends, which will lead to sometimes a third reason, infidelity, adultery. Okay, so all of them are connected. Now, the interesting thing is the financial difficulties. Now, this is the first reason that reflects the time before marriage, okay? Because finances has to deal with things like your social economic status before you're married, your family background, your work and your career, your spending habits, and even your self-esteem. So if you were to analyze all of these, you'll find that finance is really a trigger point in many of the conflict areas. And these could be the underlying reason for the many divorces you find in Singapore and all over the world. So we need to know how we communicate, what is our financial personality is like so that we can communicate with our spouses better. Okay, so in one of the sessions, there is a talk on becoming debt-free. We seem to take credit and debt for granted in this modern age. So I, was, I realized that I was borrowing money, and it was so easy to borrow money that it grew bigger and bigger, and I had to pay back the capital plus the interest. So in one of the Broadway shows called Little Shop of Horrors, it is exactly what was happening. The owner bought back the plant when it was cute and pretty. He started watering it, and it grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And one fine day, instead of just water, the plant asked to eat meat. This is exactly what happens to that. It grows bigger very quickly. So the Gospel of Matthew teach us this. In 6.21, it says that where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. 
So was my heart with the marriage? No. Was my heart with God? Uh, no. My heart was with the debt. Okay, I was focusing on that. So it is so important that we communicate as a couple such that we can resolve that and avoid it. I think another area that could become a bit of a blind spot for some couples is being too overly focused on the material needs of your children or of your family. Now, I don't have kids yet, but I really dote on my nephews and my niece, so I can absolutely understand how parents may have this very great focus on wanting to you know, ensure that their academic performance does well, that they go for tuition, enrichment classes, swimming classes, um, tennis classes, you know, all kinds of activities, right? And there's very little focus then on things like catechism or teaching them about godly values. And, you know, maybe when the kids grow up, the kids may become, or, you know, because of, you know, how there's so much focus on the materialism, um, they may become quite entitled, right? And maybe not even very grateful for all of these things that the parents may have done for the kids or the sacrifices like Xavier had to go through, right, to, to reduce his debt to, to support the children. Um, let's, let's just take a, a listen to what Archbishop may have to say about this. He's already on. Uh, uh, Raymond, is that sound? Is it? Yeah. Okay, the volume is back to the mic. I'll just put it. Or oh, maybe. Uh, No worries. No I mean, worries. Yeah, we will let Archbishop take a break also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, no worries. I think essentially um, what uh, Bishop really says is how, you know, we should have a Christ-centered marriage. Um, you know, they're, they're, if you focus too much on these, you know, material things, the your kids may not necessarily, you know, be grateful to you for it, but focus instead on godly things. Yes, that's exactly right. So if you will look at these three aspects of our lives, how do we have a Christ-centered marriage? We need to have, be a good steward of our money such that in our marriage, we can enrich ourselves with choices. We are not hampered by the lack of resources. We need to be good stewards of money such that in church, we can make meaningful contributions and we need to be good stewards of money so that we can teach our children how to manage finances in God's way. And most important, they will look at us, parents, as role models of Christian charity. Okay. Now, if you are part of a couple, I do encourage you to think practically about how you and your partner manage your money, uh, sorry, manage your monies, right? What discussions or arguments do you typically have in relation to money? And maybe these are some thought starters for you. Who has control over the family's finances? So for example, who has the bank account logins, right? Who's the principal credit card holder? I mean, it's just something to think about. Who is the breadwinner? Who makes decisions on budgets, what's to spend on, how much you can allocate to the children, how much you allocate to your, to your own spending? And are your financial goals aligned if both of you are working towards like a specific goal? So say, for example, my husband and I, we were working towards buying our first home, right? Um, you know, is that aligned? Are we, are we both actually saving for the same thing? Or is he more, you know, does he really prefer instead to spend money on his hobbies and I spend my money on, you know, buying or shopping and things like that? Or are we really kind of like, do we have our goals aligned, right? Are you prepared for emergencies? What happens if one of you is unable to work, gets sick, you know, or it becomes disabled? You know, will one spouse's salary be sufficient for all of your monthly expenses? Also, this is a, this is a very interesting one. Is there complete transparency in relation to your money, matter, uh, to your money matters? I think there are two opposing views uh, about this. Some say, okay, don't ask, don't tell, meaning we both keep our separate bank accounts and whatever I spend 
it's my money, you, whatever you spend is your money, we just, you know, contribute maybe to like a joint account just for expenses, but you don't ask me, I don't tell you kind of thing. Or is it tell all? Means every expense, you will know, my husband will know, I will know, right? Or is it like all of our monies go into one account and everything is spent from one account? So maybe you might have a very different approach. Um, so think about it for a moment, right? Uh, how much do you actually know about how your spouse approaches money? And if you think about it, do you even know how much your, your spouse makes and what that person does with their money? If you can't answer this question, it is probably something to think about. Um, at the same time, also, good things to, to kind of get your, your thoughts started around how, what's your approach to savings? How do you pay for your insurance? How much do you set aside for your groceries? How much do you set aside for your kids? Are you in debt and how are you paying that off? Your credit card debt, you know, maybe you have a housing loan. Um, are you investing? Who pays for the bills? Are you planning for your retirement or you're going to re you know, depend entirely on your CPF? How much are you donating to charity um, every month or every week? So these are some of the things to think about. Okay, I think that, um, I mean, we're almost at the end, but maybe just some things to leave you with. There's really no one-size-fits-all solution uh, when it comes to money. I think every couple, just like myself and Xavier, totally different um, family life, right? Totally different approaches to money, probably. And you need to really kind of confront these very uncomfortable conversations around money. You might have done that when you, were, when you attended EE or the marriage preparation course. But I think even as you go along your marriage, you realize that there's more things that crop up that you maybe never have discussed before, even during those preparation courses, right? So um, as individuals, um, your approach to managing money can be so influenced by things like what Xavier mentioned, right? Your in-laws, your family upbringing, your own experiences as you work, you know, your own preferences and life lessons and so on. So just an example that I can give. When I was younger, I remember my mom saying that she and my dad only had one account for absolutely everything. They just spent from one account they like complete trust in each other. And um, my mom was a homemaker. My dad, my dad worked, he was a businessman. And one day my dad came home to tell her, um, uh, honey, I, I, I bought a house. And when, she told, when my mom told me that, I was like, oh my God, if my, if my current husband now came home one day and told me I bought a house, I would go batshit crazy. But she had complete trust in my dad and there was no issue with, you know, with, with that at all, him just, using whatever monies they had to, to pay for a home. But for me, um, I think the situation is completely different. Um, you know, my, my husband is quite meticulous, so he actually goes down and looks at almost every expense that we have on our joint account, which is why I actually suggested I will have my own account <laughs> where I will take some savings aside every month after contributing to our joint account, and then that's where I spend from. And this has actually helped us to maintain some peace in our marriage, uh, because now I... Um, I'm more accountable in that sense where I know, okay, I cannot overspend. I don't want to upset him, um, but he still gives me a little bit of independence with my spending. So that's something that we have actually worked out after many, many, in fact, I think a couple of years of being very um, upset with each other. Okay, so finally, I think just um, some conclusions. This is really if, with regard to my own takeaways from my own um, the, the uncomfortable conversations that I've had with my husband. The independence with uh, accountability is important. So while you want to have a little bit of independence, I think you really do need to be accountable uh, to your spouse. You need to spend responsibly. So for me, I try to keep my expenses low. Big life decisions should really be negotiated together. Um, I think in the case of my mom and my dad, I mean, that was just shocking to me. Uh, I would never do that <laughs> to my husband. I'd never go out with a big expense without letting him know first. And also, um, some, one important thing, and this has come up a couple of times in my own marriage, right? Money should never be used as a weapon. So no one should be threatening the other, for example, that I'm not going to contribute, like especially if you are the breadwinner, I'm not going to contribute uh, to a joint account, I'm not going to give you an allowance, I'm not going to like, you know, let you um, do what, what you need to do um, with monies. Or even, for example, saying, I'm going to take all the monies out of our account and I'm not going to give you the logins or the access to that account. I think using money as a weapon is um, very damaging yeah, to a marriage. Okay, so in summary, which is the next slide, in summary, let's take an example from Genesis 18. Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and behold, 
three angels stood in front of him. My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Then he took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Now, this is how we should exercise Christian charity. Abraham had the resources and used them to serve God and the angels generously. And in turn, God blessed Abraham and Sarah, marriage with a son, Isaac. So likewise, we need to recognize God's hand in our marriage and our money. In blessing us with children, we must not forget that he should be the center of our lives. And we should teach our children without about God and the biblical way of managing money. Only then will our family be blessed. So um, that's it. We've come to the end. I hope you found the talk useful. Uh, actually, in addition uh, to this series of talks here at this uh, festival, the Catholic Foundation will also be launching uh, a five-week financial uh, stewardship course called God, Money and Me. Uh, this will start in January 2022. This program will guide you to manage your finances from a, a spiritual perspective based on sacred scripture and the Catholic Church teaching. Some of the topics that will be covered are financial principles in investments, debt recognition and avoidance, ethics and stewardship of resources. You will benefit from presentations by content experts, just like you know um, the ones that you may have experienced, uh, in-depth discussions in small groups, and practical exercises where you can put into practice what you have learned about how to manage you know, different aspects of your finances. So this pilot course is free of charge. More information is found in the flyer in your tote bag and the Catholic Foundation website. So you can scan this QR code now and register. Please approach any of the Foundation staff or email them if you want to find out more. Registration closes on the 20th of December this year. Okay. We look forward to seeing you, hopefully. Thank you very much.